They've served me red meat, which is a group two carcinogen. They've uh, given me permission, the doctors, the, you know, to drink alcohol, which is a known carcinogen cause of cancer. Why is there this massive disregard for health and nutrition in the healthcare system? Do they really care about your health or do they just care about treating the sick, and making money off of sick people? And if you think about it, it's not a conspiracy. It's just a business that thrives on sickness. All right, welcome to the Fit Vegan Podcast. I'm your show host, Maxim Seguin, and I'm the founder and CEO of Fit Vegan Coaching, a company that is on a mission to help 10,000 people get lean, thrive, and reduce their risk of chronic illnesses by 2033 and a million by 2050. I believe that having a fit, healthy body in mind is the foundation to living an incredible life, and this is what will show will give you if you choose to listen and implement. Enjoy the episode and have a great day. All right. Good morning, everyone, and welcome to another episode of the Fit Vegan Podcast. Today's a very special episode that is close to my heart, and we'll dive into that uh, uh, shortly. But I have Chris Work here, who is a Wall Street Journal bestselling author of Chris Beat Cancer. He's a speaker, patient advocate, and wellness crusader. He's also authored the book um, Beat Cancer Daily and Beat Cancer Kitchen, which I'm going to do a little giveaway at the end of this podcast. You guys are going to want to see, make sure to stay tuned for that. Um, Chris, welcome to the show, man. Well, thanks for having me. Appreciate it. Yeah, of course. Well, like I mentioned before we got started, this is very close to my heart because for the people listening, they already know this, but I, I lost my late partner to, to breast cancer almost three years ago after being her care, full-time caregiver for five years. And your work was really pivotal in her healing journey of uh, kind of choosing to go more the natural road and uh, kind of allowing her body to heal. And ultimately, I think it did wonders because the doctors gave her one year to live and she ended up living five with like a pretty incredible quality of life, I may say. And so um, I want to I want to say thank you for the work that you do, because it was huge for her. It was huge for me as someone that didn't know how to be a caregiver and had to kind of like learn as I was kind of moving along. So your resources were very helpful. Um, but yeah, I wanna, I wanna dive it, it into your story. What, obviously you kind of went through your own journey, but like, let's dive into the story a little bit and then we, we can dive deeper after. Well, before I tell my story, I just, um, just wanna offer my sincere condolences for your loss and- um, Thank you. You know, I, um, it really means a lot to me that uh, that the work I do was was um, helpful to her and to you, and that she lived so much longer than the doctors expected her to live. And you know, it, it's not uncommon, and we, we talk about this in our community a lot. It's like sometimes people don't fully recover, sometimes they don't fully heal, and um. But what we see when that, when that doesn't happen, we still often see people live far longer than they were expected to with wonderful quality of life, as you said, for many years yeah. beyond what they would have had had they gone traditional treatment. And um, so I, I, it's encouraging to me to hear that and... Um, yeah, I just, I, it's, it's, um, I don't take it lightly. No, I appreciate that. And I'm like, I'm tearing up. I told myself, I was like, to try not to cry <laughs> on the episode, but yeah, I, I really appreciate the work that you do. And I'm excited to, which is ultimately why I do the work that I do. So I'm excited to bring kind of you to kind of my audience and, and introduce them to you. Yeah. So, um, I was diagnosed at 26 years old in December 2003 with colon cancer. And the symptoms I had were um, ab abdominal pain, uh, usually after a meal, after I would eat, you know, within mm. an hour or two after eating, I would have sort of a, a weird abdominal pain that was different. It wasn't like cramping, it wasn't like gas pain. It was sort of a deep and vague um, ache. And sometimes yeah. there would be like a little bit of a sharp pain, twinge of sharp pain here and there. And it was just strange, you know. 
And um, I ignored it for the better part of a year because it wasn't debilitating. You know, it was just sort of a, a minor annoyance. <laughs> yeah. And, uh, but eventually it did progress and the pain got worse and I, be I became more and more uncomfortable. And um, so went to the doctors, got passed around, eventually had the colonoscopy. And um, they found a golf ball sized tumor in my large intestine. That's the colon. Mm. And uh, biopsied it. And within a day or two was, was uh, called and told you have colon cancer. And uh, at that point in my life, I mean, I, I had, I was a very ambitious young guy. I, I was in real estate. I was a musician. I was a newlywed. Like I was really excited about what I was doing in life. And this was just such a, it was just a total derailment yeah. of my life plan. You know, it's just like the train going off the cliff and, um, yeah. A cancer diagnosis is a shock at any age, but especially for a young person. Yeah. You know? For an older person, it's like, well, you've lived a you've lived for many decades and you've hopefully had a full life and you know it's not a big surprise, right? Because a lot of old people get cancer and it, it is one of the biggest risk factors for cancer is just aging. Yeah. But um, but yeah, when you're young, man, it just feels like your life's being stolen from you. Yeah. You know, you just feel like you don't, you know, it's like I had so, so many dreams and goals and it's like they all just sort of it felt like they all evaporated. And um, so I, I was told by my doctor, we got to get you into surgery right away and get this thing out of you before it spreads and kills you. And this is very typical in the cancer industry. Patients are rushed into treatment out of fear. And it's not to say that treatments aren't helpful. Some are, and we can get into that if you want to, but, um, the, the bigger problem is that patients are really, they're treated like victims and they are not educated. They're not informed. Um, there's very little disclosure as to what is about to happen to the person. Sure. Yeah. You have to sign a bunch of forms that nobody reads, right? before you have surgery or chemo, like you got to sign a, you know, all these pages, uh, that, but the, the doctors are not sitting down with the patients and really telling them real, the reality of their situation, yeah. whether or not the treatment's going to cure them, what the real risks of survival are, um, the short-term and long-term effects of treatments. These are really important things. And I actually have a free guide called 20 questions for your oncologist. And this is on chrisbeatcancer.com. It's on every page of the website. It's free. You can download it, go through it. And I hope you will, if you have cancer or if you're a caregiver, or if you just want to understand the cancer industry a little better, 20 questions for your oncologist will help you understand the right questions to ask so that you can make the best decision for you and also understand how doctors typically communicate with patients, which is in a way that is typically vague and uh, it produces a lot of false hope. Um, and they kind of skirt, you know, dance around the truth. Yeah. And it's because a bit dismissive is, if you challenge it. They're a bit dismissive if you challenge it. Oh, yes. Very dismissive if you even just ask, you know, simple questions. But if you're a patient, you've got to ask a lot of questions. Anyway, the 20 questions for oncologist God will help you do that. But I didn't have any of this. I wasn't that smart. I didn't think of questions to ask. <laughs> you know, I was totally clueless. And um, I went into uh, the hospital on December 30th. They took out a third of my large intestine. When I woke up, they said, it's worse than we thought. You're stage three which means mm. the, the tumor had spread through the wall of my colon and it spread to the surrounding lymph nodes. And the standard of care is uh, at that time for stage three colon cancer is uh, was surgery and then uh, chemo. So I was told that was the next step for me. And two things happened in the hospital. The first was that are worth sharing. <laughs> the first was... The very first meal 
that they served me after cutting out a third of my large intestine was a sloppy Joe. Yeah. And the sloppy Joe is, this is prison food. I mean, that's yeah. what it is. Like restaurants don't serve sloppy Joes. Like this is the worst example of like cafeteria food. Ground, some kind of ground mystery meat, beef and other animal products. Parts, yeah. Eat, right. And like stewed in some kind of sauce and then ladled onto a white burger bun. And you're, you know, I'm just thinking, I can't, like, why are they serving this? to the guy who just had half, I mean, a third of his colon removed. This is crazy. And like, are they serving this to the guy that just had open heart surgery and a quadruple bypass down the hall? Like yeah, probably. To everyone in, <laughs> in the intensive care, <laughs> you know, ward. And it's true. I mean, hospitals serve horrible food. There has been yeah. some improvements over the years. Some hospitals have become more conscientious, but generally they serve horrible food to people. Now, the other thing that happened was the day they told me I could go home, my surgeon came in to check on me and I said, hey, is there any food I need to avoid? Because I instinctively wanted to make sure I, you know, didn't cause any problems. They just took out a third of my large intestine. Everything you eat is going to go through there, right? Is going to go through the yeah. tube that they just took a section out of and then sewed back together. <laughs> and... uh so yeah, I asked this sort of innocent question. Is there any food I need to avoid? And his answer is no, nah, just don't lift anything heavier than a beer. And I love so, that that's the analogy that they use. <laughs> yeah, it's like a joke, right? He's like making a little joke. Yeah. Uh, just don't lift anything heavy. But he's also saying in so many words, like it's alcohol is fine. Yeah. So, I mean, right away I'm like, They've served me red meat, which is a group two carcinogen. They've uh, given me permission, the doctors, the, you know, to drink alcohol, which is a known carcinogen, yeah. cause of cancer. And so like, why is there this massive disregard for health and nutrition in the healthcare system? Do they really care about your health or do they just care about treating the sick, making money off of sick people. And if you think about it, it's not a conspiracy. It's just a business that thrives on sickness. Yeah. Right. If you're not sick, your doctor doesn't make money off of you. Right. You need a, you need a long line of sick people to, to stay in business as a doctor. Yeah. <laughs> At least the way our current medical model is set up. It's not designed for preventative care. Although there is, there's money to be made in, in, you know, preventative screenings and blood testing and things. But generally speaking, doctors are not trained in how to help people prevent chronic disease. And um, they're not trained in helping people reverse chronic disease either, which may sound like a shock, but they're trained in treating chronic disease. What that means is you go to med school, you learn human anatomy, and then you have to memorize all of the drugs that are used to treat conditions, right? Illness, disease, maladies. And most of those drugs do not cure the diseases that we suffer from, unless you have like a bacterial infection, right? Some kind of life-threatening yeah. infection. Drugs can cure that sometimes. Um, but if you have heart disease, cancer, diabetes, multiple sclerosis, lupus, autoimmune disease, if you have any of these chronic Western diseases, then uh, the medical approach, the allopathic approach to treatment is uh, you will find very disappointing mm -hmm. because typically what pharmaceuticals do is they, they just alleviate your suffering enough for you to get out of bed yeah. in the morning. Sometimes not enough to do that. But they keep you in a state of what I call vertical illness. You're not horizontal, right? You can get out of bed and you can get through the day, but you're not well. 
Yeah. And I know I'm, I'm on a, I'm on a rabbit trail slash rant, but this is important. And these are things I didn't understand when I was diagnosed with cancer. I, I, like I said, I was clueless, completely ignorant. And I was rushed into treatment out of fear. You know, when a patient goes to the doctor and they get a cancer diagnosis, they're all thinking the same thing. How did I get cancer? Why did I get cancer? What caused this, right? What is the cause of my problem? I mean, this is just how humans are wired, right? We know that we live in a cause and effect world. We were taught that in elementary school science, right? That everything in the world, <laughs> the entire universe operates, operates on a cause and effect principle. And so we all want to know why we got cancer. And the answer that, that patients get from their doctor is typically a shrug. Well, we don't know, but um, it might be hereditary uh, or genetic, or it, uh, it may just be bad luck. Yeah, there's never a lifestyle component that they would bring up. They never bring up lifestyle. Yeah. And when you, when a doctor answers a patient in that way, what they're telling them is in so many words, there's nothing you did to contribute to your current condition, to your disease, to your dilemma. And there's nothing you can do to help yourself other than show up for treatment. So no, you don't need to change your life. You don't need to change your diet. No, it's not stress. Nothing in your life needs to change. You just need to come show up at the next appointment and let us treat you. Mm -hmm. And uh, this to me is, it should be malpractice because there are reams of published studies on the, the known causes of cancer, the contributing factors to cancer, the diet and lifestyle interventions that can improve survival for a cancer patient. And this isn't, I mean, we, we're not in, you know, the, the, the era of Hippocrates where everything is just guesswork. Yeah. We, we have all this incredible science, published science and doctors are not trained in it. So they're not, they're not completely at fault because they don't know about it. Yeah. Um, but the patient is made into a powerless victim, right? Because they go home thinking, it's not my fault. My doctor yeah. said, I don't need to do, change anything. I don't need to take, they, and my doctor said, don't take supplements, right? My doctor said, I don't need to change my diet. And they, the nutritionist at the cancer clinic sent me home with, a, with this list of foods that I'm supposed to be eating. And that includes pizza and milkshakes and ice cream. <laughs> Yeah. So, they tell you, you just need eat whatever you want. Just so you have enough energy to recover is what they, eat, they said. Eat whatever you want. We just want to make sure you have enough calories Yeah. because chemotherapy is going to make you very sick and you're going to lose your appetite and you're yeah. going to lose weight. So we want to just make sure we keep weight on you. That's the entire goal. Um, and the goal should be to optimize that person's diet for anti-cancer nutrition. That should be the goal of every cancer nutritionist, every cancer doctor, whether or not they're giving, it doesn't matter what treatments they're giving them. What matters is what are they doing at home to help themselves survive? We also know that exercise improves survival. It's so simple. Exercise yeah. increases survival, even just walking. There's an incredible study that I reference all the time, but they did this study on breast cancer patients and they found that women with breast cancer who ate an average of five servings, five servings of fruits and vegetables per day, which is, you can do that in one meal. Yeah. And walked an average of 30 minutes per day. So they decided I'm going to eat more fruits and vegetables and I'm going to walk daily to just for my health. These women had a 50% decreased risk of death after nine years. Yeah. Just from those two things. Which are minimal two things. Yeah, minimal. Like these are shockingly easy to do, right? Yeah. Eating more fruits and vegetables and 
making a commitment. Like I'm going to, I'm going to go for a walk every day for 30 minutes, which like, that's like a mile and a half. Yeah. That's not, that's not a, <laughs> that's not a huge walk. And why, why is every breast cancer patient not told about this study by their doctor in the first visit? Right. To me, that that's, that's really what kind of makes my blood boil because, um, there's a, there's just a, a negligence in the medical yeah. community to actually help people survive, to actually care for them. If, if the advice is not centered around the next treatment, the next drug, the next radio therapy or surgery or whatever, right? It's not a money-making treatment. They just tend to sh just shrug it off. Yeah. So <clears throat> again, these are more things I didn't know about <laughs> in January, 2004, when I was trying to figure out how to survive. But I got home from the hospital and as I weaned myself off the pain medication over the course of about a week, I, I, I just really sobered up and, and started thinking about my life and my health and my future. And, and I, I, I'd seen what chemotherapy does to people, right? It's, yeah. it's, it's destructive. destructive. We've yeah. all seen, most of us, I would say, have seen advanced cancer patients in real life or even in TV and the movies you know, how emaciated they become and, and sick they become. And, and it's, it's horrific to see another human in that physical state, you know? Um, and, and I, and I, I saw myself in that state and it was frightening. Um, and so I prayed about it and as I'm a Christian. I just said, God, if there's another way besides chemotherapy, please show me, you know, I tr I just trust you to supply all of my needs and, you know, to lead me in the path of healing. And two days later, I got a book that was sent to me from a friend of my dad's who lives in Alaska. And he had somehow heard about this guy, George Malcolmus, who had healed his colon cancer with uh, raw food, a raw mm. vegan diet and juicing. And uh, George had was was diagnosed in his 40s with colon cancer, and he had seen his mother and a number of uh, church members go through treatment and suffer and die. And he, you know, so he had reservations about doing treatment. Yeah. And he happened to have a friend who said, "Look, you need to go back to the Garden of Eden. Back to the Garden of Eden. Eat raw fruits and vegetables, all organic." Get yourself a juicer, drink carrot juice every day. That's what you need to do. Was Gerson and a thing back then? It was. Okay. Gerson therapy was a thing for sure. And so this is what George did. And it, within a year, all of his symptoms had resolved. Cancer was gone. His body healed. Mm -hmm. And it wasn't a miracle. It was just the natural healing process, right? He was able to empower his body to heal through nutrition and lifestyle change. He also started running, you know, running every day. And I was so inspired by his story. I was overcome with emotion. I mean, I was probably one or two chapters in just sitting on the couch, like sobbing, you know, just, I knew it was an answer to prayer. I knew this is what I had to do. And, uh, and George's story gave me just that tiny little spark of, of hope and confidence and the belief that healing was possible. Yeah. And that's the most important thing of all is you must believe that healing is possible. And most patients, they, they don't even know, they don't know if healing is possible. They hope it's possible, right? Yeah. They, they cross their fingers and wish that it might somehow be possible for them, but they don't have the confidence to know that it's possible. And when you meet someone who's accomplished something that you want to do and you see that they've done it, then you know it's possible. Yeah. <laughs> right? How many people have to climb Mount Everest before you believe it's possible? Yeah. Right? Doesn't mean it's easy. Yeah. I it's had still a friend do it. <laughs> right? It's, it's yeah, still it's difficult. Tough. It's life-threatening. You could die along the way, right? You yeah. could die in the process of trying to achieve that but it's possible. And so I immediately like 
I did not delay. There, I did not deliberate. I went straight to Whole Foods that day, loaded up the cart with fruits and vegetables, bought a juicer. They used to sell juicers at Whole Foods. Um, now they just sell juice in plastic bottles. Yeah. <laughs> it, um, what kind was it? Those like rapid juicers or the slow masticating juicers? It was a champion. Then? Okay. It was the the classic, the legendary champion juicer, which is they're now out of business. They, they, um, you know, they, they were probably in business for 30 or I don't know, 40 or 50 years, a long time. Yeah. And, um, so I, I bought the champion juicer loaded, you know, bought a bunch of bags of carrots and went home and just, here we go. Like, I'm going to figure this out. And, uh, and I, I quickly figured out that the easiest way for me to get the, the, the highest volume of fruits and vegetables into my body was with the giant salads. Yeah. Just huge bowl full of vegetables, apple cider vinegar, a little bit of olive oil. And then I would just load it up with spices because I was, as I was reading and researching, I was learning there's all these incredible anti-cancer compounds and spices, garlic, oregano, turmeric, curry powder, which has turmeric in it and some other things. Um, Cilantro. Uh, cayenne pepper. Yeah. And so I, I, I created this like delicious kind of savory, spicy salad dressing and it made it taste so good. And, and so in the bowl was broccoli, cauliflower, kale, cabbage, onions, mushrooms, peppers, sprouts, avocado. You could put some almonds and walnuts on there, uh, sauerkraut, and then the apple cider vinegar, olive oil, and spices. So you've got all this raw food. You got a little bit of fermented food in the sauerkraut and the apple cider vinegar. And uh, I just realized this is it. Like this is the most potent, most nutritious anti-cancer meal possible. And I need to eat this every day. And then I thought, well, if I need to eat it every day, maybe I need to eat it twice every day. <laughs> right. Yeah. Lunch and dinner. That's, that's an overachiever thinking right there. It's like more must be better. <laughs> more is better. Yeah. Well, it's like, and it wasn't even, yeah, it was like, I've got to eat another meal. Like why compromise, right? Why? I mean, yeah. It's not like, I'm going to eat a giant salad for lunch and then hot dogs for dinner. You know, it's like, yeah. yeah. I, so my routine, I just created this really simple nutritional routine, routine for myself. Every morning I'd get up, I'd run the juicer, I'd make all my juice for the day, carrot juice, I'll straight carrot juice some days. And, and then I started to add more stuff to it, like beets or celery and ginger root and things like that. And then kind of juice through the morning, and then giant salad for lunch, maybe kind of like 11 a.m., a little bit earlier. And then giant salad for dinner. <clears throat> and then some days uh, in mid-afternoon, if I was feeling a little bit hungry, I would make a fruit smoothie. Blueberries, blackberries, raspberries, strawberries. Um, blend it up in, you know, with a banana and some water. And it's delicious. And... That was the simple routine that I followed every single day, every day. I just ate the same thing every day and it was delicious. It filled me up. It gave me energy. Like, and so after doing that for about a week, I was like, man, the first few days are weird when you, when you change your diet, yeah. because when you get away from eating a diet, that's really high in animal protein and fat, you know, meat and cheese and processed food and sugar and yeah. caffeine. Well, these are all stimulants. So you've been running on these stimulants, like protein is a stimulant, dairy is a stimulant, caffeine is a stimulant, re refined sugar and corn syrup are stimulants. So like I was running on stimulants. And, uh, and so, yeah, the first few days I, when I stopped eating those foods, I felt pretty lousy. Yeah. And whether that was a detox reaction happening, or it was just withdrawal from the, from these addictive foods or both, but this is very common. Yeah. But once I turned that corner, it was like day three or four, all of a sudden it was like, man, I feel good today. Wow. I really, really feel good. And, uh, I got that healing momentum going, right? The hardest part is just getting that ball rolling like that. Think about a, a giant concrete ball, right? It takes a lot of effort and energy to get a giant concrete ball rolling, <laughs> you know, but then once it's in motion, it's easy to keep it rolling, 
right? Yeah. Assuming you're on a flat surface. <laughs> yeah, yeah. And the energy is smoother too once you get to that place. Yes. Like it's a it's a nicer energy. Yeah. And this is actually a pr a principle of physics that it's it's harder to uh to get takes more energy to get an object in motion than it is to keep it in motion. And this is this applies to our own effort in life. And so change is hard, but just in the beginning. And then once you get over that little bit of difficulty and and uh get over the learning curve then it, things start to sort of fall into place and get organized and automated and efficient and you get into the groove. And so that's what happened for me. Uh, I had a lot of family pressure to do chemotherapy and I talk about this in my book, you know, um, it was really difficult at first because everyone around me wanted to, me to do chemo and, uh, <clears throat> they were telling me, you know, you have to do exactly what the doctor says. Yeah. And in my mind, I was, I understood uh, why, because they cared about me. And that's but all they I knew. I was also really frustrated because I didn't feel supported. Yeah. And, you know, I was told I was being stubborn or whatever. And it was, I, I just had to come to the realization and accept the fact that if I was going to do this, I was going to have to do it alone. Did you have your wife at that time? I did. Okay. Okay. I did. And I don't mean to throw her under the bus. She's amazing. But in the very beginning, she was afraid that I was going to die. And, and she had grown up in a family that was very conventional. Yeah. I mean, like you go to the doctor for everything. Yeah. And I grew up in a family that was, I wouldn't say like, radical, right? But just slightly non-conventional. Like we hardly ever went to the doctor yeah. for things. And my mom, you know, would take me to the chiropractor. <laughs> yeah. you, know? you just need and, to get a line, Chris. <laughs> yeah. So I was exposed to that sort of holistic world uh, at an early age. So I knew there was, and even my chiropractor, it's funny, I can remember those early visits to the chiropractor where he was explaining their philosophy and their approach to me. So, and helping me understand, you know, that, um, they, they want to get to the root cause of disease, right? The naturopathic model of medicine is not to cut people open and, you know, pump them full of pills. It's to, to help solve the problem of their pain. Yeah. And like with chiropractic, it's like, no, we, we want to try to, you know, fix your, your pain problem without surgery and pills. Right. So I, I, I appreciated that a lot and it really did stick with me. And, and, um, and so then here I am, you know, facing these decisions and, and I realized, oh, this, this naturopathic and holistic health model is, is what resonates with me and what I have more confidence in. And also just the, the fact that it's a do no do no harm approach. Yeah. Right. I just, people treat their bodies as if it's a, like a car Oh, the chain is broken. Just remove it. We'll put another one in. Right. You don't think about that. The fact that the body can heal itself. Yeah. Well, and you know, we've been conditioned through marketing and the media to, to look for that or to believe that there's a quick fix for everything. Yeah. Right. And so medicine has capitalized and exploited this, the, 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 you know, allopathic medical model exploited the fact that, oh, I've got pain. Here's a pill, right? To make your pain go away. Didn't fix the problem, but we yeah. can make your pain go away today. Right. And so, oh, you got a, you've got a gallbladder that's, you know, acting up. We'll just take it out. <laughs> right. Got a nodule on your thyroid. No problem. We'll just remove your thyroid. You know, it's like. If, and, and these are very, uh, profitable procedures. Yeah. Right? So the incentive is for the surgeon or the doctor is to cut off the body part, <laughs> right? Cause that's how they make a living. They yeah. want to cut it off. Yeah. And, uh, and so it, unfortunately medicine, uh, has created this sort of perfect storm where, people who are in medicine, who work as healthcare professionals, 
are incentivized by money, right? To do things that are not necessarily in the best interest of the patients, but they are assured that what they're doing is the best thing for the patient, right? Mm -hmm. They're indoctrinated to believe that this is the standard of care. This is the best treatment for the patient. Therefore, you should go to bed feeling confident and feeling good about yourself that you're cutting off body parts every day. So um, <clears throat> more rabbit trails. But, you know, I had this pressure to do chemo and um, we had an appointment with an oncologist. And I talk about it in the book in more detail, but it went badly. And I left that appointment so discouraged and depressed. And he had basically, um, you know, coerced me into doing chemo. I mean, he basically just said, if you don't do it, you're going to die. And he used fear to manipulate me. Yeah. And I made an appointment to get a port in a few weeks. Um, but I'm just so thankful to God that I didn't, that, you know, that I had time because so many cancer patients, they, they get them, man, they get them on the chemo like train back to back the days, yeah, like the just, day after another. Exactly. Before you have time to blink, like you are, you're signed up, you're at the, the, the office, you are getting cut open or injected or whatever. Yeah. You don't have time radiated. to think. And you, there's no time to read or research or think or pray or anything like, you know, and I had time, uh, cause I was still recovering from surgery. So, you know, and I had been on the raw food diet for a week and I just went home and I was so discouraged and depressed after the appointment with this oncologist. I mean, he just sucked all the hope out of my body. You know, it was just, it was difficult, but I, man, I just got on my knees and prayed and just decided, you know, I, I'm just going to fire up the juicer, mm -hmm. right? I'm not going to sit here and feel sorry for myself or, or just, just give up and just start, you know, getting drive through, you know, whoppers. <laughs> yeah. It's on right? the way back from the hospital. <laughs> yeah. And pizza delivery and stuff and sloppy Joe's. Actually, I wouldn't eat sloppy Joe's anyway. You couldn't pay me to eat a sloppy Joe. Yeah. Um, I just, I was like, well, I don't know, but I, I know what I need to do. Like, I don't know what the future holds, but I, I had conviction. Like I've got to stay on this healthy path. And uh, so I did. And then several weeks later, when the day finally came for me to go get the port for chemo, I woke up that morning and I was like, you know what? This is not what I want to do. Yeah. I'm, I'm going to live or die on my own terms. Yeah. And it wasn't like I said, I'm never going to do chemo. It was just like, not now right? This is not what I want to do right now. Right now I have this passion and conviction that I need to build my body up. I don't want to tear it down. I'm already weak and vulnerable and it, I'd lost so much weight. I was clinically underweight when I was, yeah. in, you know, it's not in good physical shape and chemo would have just destroyed me. Yeah. And you know, I, I just sensed that right in my, the core of my being in my gut, like I just knew I wasn't strong enough. And so, uh, so I didn't go. Right. I was just like, I'm not going. <laughs> like, and that, I'm sure they were happy about that. <laughs> that led, no, <clears throat> excuse me. No one was happy about that decision. Um, and, uh, but I knew that it was the, the decision I had to make. Right. I had to make this really hard decision. I had to go and forge my path alone without any support and yeah. trust that God would lead me and that he would make a way for me. And that, you know, there's this verse in Romans it says that God works all things for the good of those who love him. It's like, that's a, that's an incredible promise that he works all things for the good of those who love him all things. That means he works the bad things for your good. Yeah. And, and that you can do all things through Christ who strengthens you. Philippians 4.13. Yes, absolutely. And so, man, I was, I was just memorizing scripture left and right, praying it, quoting it. Like it was just like, I was just like feeding on the word. Mm -hmm. And, um, like I like to say, like it was like at that time, it was just me, Jesus and a juicer. Yeah, that was it, man. Like, <laughs> and so, uh, but, but my wife came around, she came around. It didn't take long, 
you know, after that appointment went badly, she it kind of opened her eyes to how sort of callous and cold uh, that oncologists can be. Yeah. And um, she, it really made her question like medicine and doctors. And um, I found a naturopathic doctor quickly. I found uh, he connected me with an integrative oncologist. Like once you kind of crack the door open into the holistic world, they all know each other, you know, like, yeah. And so you can get referrals, right? Your chiropractor knows people, the acupuncturist, right? The, you know, the naturopath, like they, they all know each other. And so I started getting referred, you know, referrals and recommendations. Oh, you should see this person. You should see this person. Like, you know, and so it, it started me on this adventure of, um, you know, treatments and therapies and, uh, and practitioners and, uh, and I enjoyed it. Like I enjoyed the process and I got so much confirmation and hope and encouragement along the way. And, you know, you're desperate for that when you step out in faith and you're alone, it's like Peter stepping out of the boat, right? Yeah, and he's like, he sees Jesus and he's walking on water. Like, you know, that's super scary, right? And so I needed encouragement and reassurance, like, you know, every day. And I didn't get it every day, but when I did, it was like so precious to me when the right person or a piece of information or a book or something would come into my life. I just always knew like, okay, I'm on the right path. Like, this is just another, a sign for me. It's confirmation. Like, just keep going, like stay on the path. I, I, I liken it to being like when you're, if you ever go hiking, there's always a moment in the hike where you're like, are we lost? <laughs> <laughs> you know? And, uh, but you, but you carry on, right. You're on the trail, right. You're like, well, we'll just stay on this trail. And then eventually you see a sign or marker or something. You're like, oh, okay, no. All right. Yeah, I'm fine. Right? The stress, <laughs> the stress is relieved. You're not worried. Like, okay, yep. This is the right way. Let's we'll just, let's keep on going. And so that's what that was for me. There was just these little, these little mile markers or little signposts along the way um, that God provided for me just to keep me on the path. And, uh, and so, yeah, I mean, uh, the short version is I had blood work done every month. I had CT scans every six months for several years. And I just stayed on this path yeah. and eventually got to five years and it was like still no cancer. And then uh, about six and a half years after my diagnosis, I, <clears throat> I just felt like I needed to share my story. I, I just knew there were people that needed hope and encouragement and I'd learned so much. Um, that I, so I started this blog called Chris beat cancer. I didn't even know how to start a blog. I had to get a buddy of mine to help me like set it up. <laughs> you know? Yeah. It worked out yeah. pretty well. Like, <laughs> it's you get a pretty big blog at this point. It, it's grown. <laughs> it's grown. Yeah. But yeah, I mean, I like, I didn't literally, I didn't know how to do anything on the internet in 2010 and, uh, you know, started the Facebook page and a YouTube channel and just started sharing what I'd learned and sharing my story and, and then people started finding me and saying, Hey, I, this is, a, I love your story. I healed cancer naturally too. And here's my story. And then I started interviewing other survivors mm -hmm. and, uh, that's really where I, I found my passion. And it wasn't just like telling my story over and over again. It was sharing these incredible healing stories of other people, which just adds to the evidence that healing is possible. Yeah. And I don't expect anyone to just believe one story, mine or someone else's. But what I want to encourage you to do is pay attention to all the stories. Like really research and learn from every person that you can find who has healed cancer against the odds. And I've interviewed dozens and dozens and dozens of people. I mean, I, I, I stopped counting. It's a lot. Yeah. And uh, people who've healed all types and all types and stages of cancer. And you will find the common threads in those stories of, you know, the nutrition is it's almost always a whole food plant based diet, lots of raw food and, and fresh juice is almost always huge, huge component of healing exercise, huge component, stress reduction, huge component, right? Rearranging yeah. your life, like really looking around and saying, like, what is making me sick? Yeah. Right detoxification, cleaning out your house, getting away from a toxic work environment, 
these are big steps that can really produce like significant improvements in your life and your health, getting out of toxic relationships, forgiving the people who've hurt you. These are the pillars of healing, like everything yeah. I just said. And, and by the way, you didn't hear me say any crazy like uh, lotion or potion or alternative treatment, right? Or therapy in Mexico or Germany. No, yeah. it's not those things. Well, those we things, looked into those too, but yeah, I know what you mean. The basics. Those things can be helpful. There's certainly a lot of things out there that are what I call do no harm therapies. Right? Yeah. There may be some benefit, but there's no risk of harm. And my, my approach and it, my opinion still is if there's a potential benefit and no risk of harm and I can find it and afford it, I'll do it. Yeah. Cause some of those are expensive Germany and like Mexico, like they're pretty pricey. Yes. The clinics can be very expensive. And what happens at the clinics, unfortunately is, is most of the people who go to the clinics, it is the last resort. Yeah. Right. They have done every conventional treatment available. Their bodies are destroyed Yeah, and they are stage four terminal and um, and this is their last ditch effort, right? And it's, it's really hard to recover when you've been brutalized, right? Yeah. It's really hard. And so many of these holistic clinics, in my opinion, get a bad rap because the patients are already dying. Yeah. I, like med, the conventional medicine has already failed them and sent them home to die. And yet you still see some people recover. Yeah, if right. they would have Which gone there so... at the start, right? But the thing is that it's so pricey. Like we waited till the end to be like, well, this is like it was like forty plus grand. I was like, well, you know, we should wait till the end, you know, and try other things first. But by the time you get to that point, the body has been beaten down a lot more. Yeah, and there certainly is. A, a, there can be a point of no return, or you know, just a point yeah. in a patient's health journey where. They, they just get, they're just too sick sometimes, mm -hmm. right? It's too, they're too far gone. It's hard to get them back. But, but the point is like, there's a lot of benefits to those places, but, but the real healing happens at home. Yeah. Like, you know, you can get a, you can get a, a measurable benefit in three weeks at a clinic for $20,000 or $40,000. Like people, their, their tumors may shrink. They, they get their energy back. They get out of wheelchairs, right? I mean, their blood work changes dramatically. Like good things happen, but, yeah, but they healing, go back in their environment at home after healing happens at home. So yeah. you, what I focus on is helping people change that home environment and, and do everything in their power to help themselves heal. Yeah. And that, that really boils down to your daily choices. What are you doing every day? What are you eating? How are you taking care of yourself? How are you ma managing your stress? Uh, what? What's your faith like? Um, you know, are you forgiving the people who've hurt you? <laughs> it's such a huge thing. And yeah. so, <clears throat> uh, so to me, we've seen, we've got a private community of people. And obviously I've been doing this publicly as a patient advocate and survivor since 2010. So now almost 14 years. And, I, and um, just seen incredible, incredible healing stories from yeah. people who did the same things that I did, you know, and everybody's story is a little different, but you got to look at the common threads. And when you study yeah. people who've healed, you see the common threads and you realize there's value to this. Like this is not a fluke. It's not a, an anomaly. This person didn't just get lucky. Like they did the same things that everybody else who healed did and they yeah. healed too. So <clears throat> I think I just get excited about that. So I'm constantly interviewing new new yeah. cancer survivors and holistic survivors and sharing those stories. And, and, yeah. um, and it really gets me pumped up. Like I just love to do it. And then of course I've interviewed a lot of doctors and experts and researchers and interesting people that, um, are, uh, either in completely holistic field or in an in integrative, taking an integrative approach to cancer or doing really interesting research on like Dr. Walter Longo on fasting and how that impacts cancer and, so yes, it's, it's, it's crazy how, um, 
Yeah. Let, this has taken over my life and I didn't expect it to at all. Yeah. Well, let me ask you this. Like, I'm on a very similar mission as you, right? I'm trying to do more. I'm like on the fitness and whole food plant-based eating side. It's like the preventative side. And we donate to cancer patients every month financially to kind of support them with kind of like the buying the food and the juicers, kind of all, all these things. And I feel like if I, I'll start with this, if I could have a superpower, it would be to like be able to snap my finger and switch that switch in people's head that would make them want to have that change. Like the, can the cancer diagnosis without having the cancer diagnosis, right? And so if you're, if you're comfortable with it, do you mind kind of sharing with us what it was like emotionally and psychologically to kind of go through that, what it was like with your partner? I don't know if you had kids at the time, because my hope is that everyone listening doesn't go through it, but gets to kind of feel a little bit of it through kind of your, what you went through so that they can like start to make that change. Right. That's great. Well, it's, it's hard to get people interested in prevention. <laughs> it, it is. I mean, that's, that's the reality. Unless yeah. they've watched a loved one suffer and die, you know, yeah. and they become what I call cancer conscious as yeah. you are. Yeah. Right? You've seen it so close and firsthand that you are conscious of the threat of this disease. And you're also aware that there's so many steps you can take to lower your risk. Yeah. And I would never say you can make yourself cancer proof, but you can put yourself in the lowest risk category yeah. of getting cancer. And so <clears throat> it, look, Benjamin Franklin said it, an ounce of prevention is worth a pound of cure. It's so much easier to take those steps now to reduce your risk than it is once you're in the throes of crisis right? Of a diagnosis and all the pressure to do treatment and all this stuff. And it's really scary. And it's really hard to say no. Yeah. It's hard to say no to chemo. Yeah. And, and so, yeah, I, as much as I'm trying to encourage cancer patients, I'm also doing the same thing. I'm trying to reach people before they get a diagnosis and say, Hey, like, let's make these changes now. Let's make these lifestyle shifts now. So you don't have to get cancer. <laughs> like you can avoid it. And so the big things, I want to talk about the, the big things that people can do, but I guess before I do that, um, uh, there are 5,000 people diagnosed with cancer every day in the U.S. Um, there are, uh, the number of people diagnosed with cancer every year is going up. Yep. The number one cause of cancer is smoking. It's still smoking. Although smoking rates are on the decline, which is good, which means lung cancer rates are on the decline, which means death from lung cancer is on the decline, which also means death from other cancers associated with smoking are declining. So that's great progress, right? The second leading cause of cancer is obesity. That is rising. We have more overweight and obese people than ever before. And so what are the two biggest things you can do to reduce your risk of cancer? Don't smoke, don't vape and get yourself to a healthy body weight. And like, I love that you're, you know, you have a health like nutrition and fitness focus because they go hand in hand. Exercise yeah. reduces your risk of cancer. Exercise increases your odds of survival. If you have cancer, it, it's awesome. It's so good for you. And most people just think, oh, exercise is just for looking good on the beach or naked, <laughs> you know, right? Yeah. It's like, yeah, sure. Right. It's, you can do it for those reasons, but the internal benefits, the genetic switches that you're flipping, the metabolic benefits, the cardiovascular benefits, the immune system and nervous system benefits, the neurological benefits of exercise are all well, well documented. And they're all good. And so, um, so this is a major thing is just, if you can commit to exercising five or six days a week for about half an hour, anything you like to do, whether it's brisk walking or marathon running or jujitsu or CrossFit or yoga or whatever, it's all good. Yeah. All of it. Whatever you enjoy, put it on the calendar, block it off, make it a priority. 
Nutrition's a big thing. Obviously the, the, the best diet for anti-cancer diet is a whole food plant-based diet. Whether you call yourself a vegan or not, it, it doesn't really matter. And you can call yourself a vegan and you can be a vegan and eat junk food all day. Yeah. And so it's important that uh, you're focused on whole plant foods and not just, you know, Dr. Pepper and Oreos. And so <clears throat> we, there are all of these incredible anti-cancer compounds in fruits and vegetables. And I, and I go into a lot of detail in my book, Chris Beat Cancer, but the most potent ones I talked about earlier that are in the giant salad, those are the cruciferous vegetables and the allium vegetables. So it's broccoli, cauliflower, kale, cabbage, onions, and garlic. I mean, these are incredible. It's the salad vegetables and they're more potent raw than they are cooked. They lose significant amount of the special anti-cancer compounds and molecules when you cook those types of vegetables. Yeah. So eat, shifting away from eating tons of meat and dairy, processed food and junk food to eating more plant food, more fruits and vegetables. Don't be afraid of fruit. Fruit's awesome. Don't let anyone demonize fruit and tell you it's too much sugar. It's not. Fruit's great. <clears throat> so eating, a, a shifting to a, a predominantly plant-based diet is huge. Huge way to reduce your risk of many types of cancer. Exercising every day, huge way to reduce your risk of cancer. Not smoking and then not drinking. Alcohol is a known cause of cancer. There's eight different types of cancer associated with alcohol. Now, doesn't mean you can't have a drink every once in a while, but daily drinking definitely increases your risk of cancer. Yeah. There is no safe amount of daily alcohol, period. If you had one drink a week, yeah, you're, I mean, you're probably fine, right? One beer a week, it's not a big deal, right? A couple drinks a month, not a big deal. But daily drinking, you are poisoning yourself because alcohol metabolizes into a cancer-causing compound in your liver called acetaldehyde. Google it. It is a carcinogen. So like right there, I mean, those are the, the big four, like the biggest four levers that you can pull in your life to reduce your risk of cancer. And of course, doing that for a week doesn't have much impact, right? It's, yeah. these are lifestyle changes that the longer you do them, the bigger the impact, right? In your health. And then you just maintain that, you know, sort of low level of cancer risk. Um, <clears throat> now I, the last little bit, and I know we're getting close to time here, but stress is a major contributor to cancer. And there's yeah. a lot of debate, heated debate about this. Like, oh no, stress doesn't cause cancer. And yes, it does. And all this. I'm here to tell you stress is a major underlying cause of cancer because when you're in, when you're in a state of stress, whether it's from your past, and that would be anger and bitterness and resentment toward people who've hurt you or guilt and shame for your mistakes, regret, or your stress is coming from present day problems like, you know, money problems or relationship problems, or work problems, right? Or unhealthy emotions that you struggle with every day, like insecurity and jealousy and envy. I'm just going to throw one in there. Being, be a, being a very type A overachiever that doesn't know how to rest. And that's always right. going, going and going. Yeah, That was me. Yeah. That was me. The overachiever, very competitive, but that was rooted in jealousy. Yeah. It was rooted in insecurity and, uh, and pride. So those are, so those are negative emotions that produce this overachiever behavior. And then the other source of stress would be rooted in the future. And that would be fear, worry, and anxiety about the future. And guess what? Most of us are jumping back and forth bet between these stressful states, right? One, one moment we're worried about something in the future. What if this happens? What if that happens? Oh, the economy, the war, right? What if there's another plague, you know? Uh, and then we're on Facebook or Instagram looking at somebody and being envious and jealous of them because they're in Tahiti, <laughs> yeah. right? And they're better looking than you, <laughs> right? Mm -hmm. and, and, then, and then we're thinking about some other person that hurt us in our past. And we're, we're ruminating on that anger and, and bitterness 
right? And so, so many of us are jumping back and forth between these stressful states. So we're just stay in a state of chronic stress, not to mention dealing with day-to-day -day problems that come up. And so the umbrella of stress is negative emotion. When you're in that state, your body reacts by increasing your adrenaline and cortisol. Well, cortisol suppresses your immune function. Cortisol increases inflammation in your body. Cortisol tells your body to store fat. So it promotes weight gain, unhealthy weight gain. And if you think about a person who's in a state of just chronic stress from all of that stuff I mentioned and just problems in their life, and right? Over years, sometimes decades, their body just over time, it gets weaker and weaker and more vulnerable and more uh, it shifts into a state that's what we call hospitable to cancer. Yeah. Right. Becomes Let when you have a weak immune system and chronic inflammation, that is the environment where cancer thrives. And the good news is, is you can shift your body out of that state, but you have to understand what's causing the state. <laughs> like what are the choices that you're making and your attitudes and thoughts and behaviors that are causing this pro-cancer straight state and how can you stop doing those things, right? So the food and exercise and breaking your bad habits, these are the big steps you can take right away. The steps that take time to work through is your thoughts, right? Your thought life and your emotions. And so what I learned to do, what cancer taught me to do was, first of all, give my fear to God. Like every day the fear is creeping in. I didn't, I was never a worrier before cancer, but yeah. then you get cancer and, and every day the fear and worry and anxiety is just, it is just trying to invade your mind and your heart. And so I was constantly giving my fear to God and just saying, I trust you. I'm giving you my fear. I'm not going to be afraid. You know, I'm not going to let this steal my joy. I'm just going to be thankful for today that I'm alive and I'm not dying in the hospital. Right. I'm just going to just practice gratitude. And then I started catching myself in negative thoughts, being critical and judgmental, right? And envious. And I'd be like, oh, I'm being critical right now. I'm being negative right now. I'm being envious right now. I'm going to stop myself, right? Yeah. I'm going to stop myself. It's like if you've got a bad habit of biting your fingernails, right? There's a moment where you realize you're doing it and you can stop yourself, right? And so these are bad thought habits, that many of us have gotten in, in this routine and, and you can stop, like you can break the habit. And then the biggest one of all is forgiving every person who's ever hurt you. I mean, and I, I, you know, the more I read from cancer patients and holistic practitioners and brilliant people, this, this message of anger and bitterness being a root cause of cancer, like I just kept stumbling across it, you know? Yeah. And, and I, in the, initially I thought that's not my, that's not the reason for me. You know, that's not it. But I also realized like, I, I should be open to this and yeah. I should just go ahead and assume that maybe it is a cause, right? Just let me just assume that it might be a cause for me. <laughs> Right. And this was part of my overall philosophy that I, I took full responsibility for my health. And I, I just said, you know, maybe this is my fault. Maybe the cancer is my fault. I'm not a victim. Maybe my choices led me to this path, down this path of disease. So I need to change what I'm doing. I need to make different choices. And so I decided I chose to forgive every person who has ever hurt me. And you can't do it in one sitting. You have to do it <laughs> <Nah>. one, <laughs> one person at a time by name. Now, you don't have to go meet them. You don't have to have a meeting or a phone call or anything. You just have to sit down quietly and you conjure up the memory, right? You revisit this insult or injury or abuse or betrayal, right? Or neglect or whatever it was. You revisit it and you just say, okay, God, right? You just get vulnerable. You just say, God, you know how I feel about this. And you know, I don't want to forgive this person. I don't, I don't want to. 
but I'm choosing to forgive. I'm letting it go and I'm just giving it to you. I'm, you're, they're all yours, mm -hmm. right? They're all yours. I'm not going to carry this pain and anger and resentment anymore. Forgive me for holding on to it for so long. And I'm asking you to bless them. Boy, that sounds hard, right? It's harder than eating you. whole food plant based. That's for sure. <laughs> yeah. Right. It's harder than a, harder than a veggie burger. I'm asking you to bless the person who hurt me. Why would I do that? Well, Jesus said, love your enemies and pray for those who persecute you. It's like, wow. I mean, that is deep stuff, right? Love your enemies and pray for those who persecute you. So I'm like, all right, I'm just, tr I'm trying to follow Jesus. I'm taking Jesus's advice, right? He said to do this, I'm going to do it. And you know what happens when you do it? God heals your heart. Yeah. He heals your heart. It's, it's incredible. Like the burden and the weight is lifted off of you. And so just one by one, I just, you know, <laughs> over time just would sit down and go through, you know, I would sort of go, go through like marathons where I'm like, all right, it's forgiveness time, you know, and for 20 minutes or, you know, 30 minutes or an hour, however long I would just think through every person in my life, just like racking my brains, man. Just like, who, who do I need to forgive? Like, and I just would just get on a, you know, just get on a tear, just forgiving everybody. And it was so freeing and powerful. And I still do it. Like, you know, I still, you know, go through and take inventory. Like, who do I need to forgive? You know, who's, you know, because people constantly hurt you, right? I mean, if you're on yeah. the internet, <laughs> like, there's no lack of been, that. <laughs> people have been meaner to me on the internet than they ever were before I, you know, was a public figure or whatever. So, but I, but I've learned to just to be quick to forgive, right? I'm just like, ouch. Okay. Well, that comment hurt. That was, that was, that person is deliberately trying to hurt me. Right. Yeah. But I forgive them and God bless them. I'm just letting, letting it go. Right. And so again, there's a lot to do. There's a lot you can do to help yourself. That's the good news, right? Don't be overwhelmed. You can't do it all in one day. But if you're committed to the healthy path, then, you know, day by day, you can just start making these positive changes and these improvements in your diet and exercising, doing breath work, maybe doing some cold plunges and some saunas, you know, and forgiving the people who've hurt you and re reorganizing your life and your relationships, you know, so that they're not stressful and toxic. These are all things you can do. And most of the things we've talked about today cost no money. Yeah. Right. They don't cost anything. It, all you have to do is be, is be committed to do them. Right. And be, uh, determined to get well, to take care of yourself, to stay diligent and focused and, and stay on the healthy path. So just crammed a lot into an hour. <laughs> no, I, I, I appreciate that. Well, um, let me ask you one last question. Do you have a little bit of time? I want to be respectful yeah, yeah, of your yeah. time. Okay. So, um, a lot of the people, we attract who we are. So I have a lot of really type A overachievers in my life. I'm very cancer aware because of what I went through as a caregiver for five years. And I'm only 30, right? And I was 22 when my partner got diagnosed at the time. So I've been cancer aware for a very long time. But man, that, that desire to want to help people not have cancer is why I do what I do. But then there's the danger of like putting myself in a position where I would potentially get cancer because I'm pushing too much to help people get cancer. And so my selfish question to you is like, how do you manage wanting to have that impact, but still being able to care for yourself to not put yourself back in that position? It's an awesome question. You just have to set boundaries, man. You've got to set boundaries for yourself, for your work life balance and being okay with, well, first of all, I, I stopped competing, right? I'm, I'm a very driven competitive person, but I realized that was not healthy for me mm -hmm. psychologically and, and with stress. So I, I stopped competing. I stopped caring. 
about competing, about being the best or the biggest or the getting more views or likes or listens, you know, whatever. It just, to me, once I stopped that kind of thinking and then I prioritized my life and I, and I realized like, what, what, what's the, what would I rather be doing more than anything is time with my family. So I'm married, I have two children. And so for me, it was like, I don't want my kids to grow up saying, well, our dad was never around because he was always traveling and speaking, right? Yeah. Or our dad was always in his office working and we never saw him. So I, I had a conscious like awareness, like this is not the life I want to create for my children. And I get so much joy being with my family that it, it became such an obvious priority. And, and by the way, <laughs> I have the benefit of cancer resetting my perspective. Because when you get a diagnosis, everything you thought was important is not important anymore, right? And there's an old expression, the, the healthy person cares about everything. The sick person just cares about one thing. Yeah, I saw that. Right? They just care I about noticed thing, that. Like getting well. Yeah. That's all they care about. And so when I was sick, all I cared about was getting well and, and you know, taking care of my wife. And then we got pregnant and we had a baby on the way. And then a year after my diagnosis, we were in the hospital and I had this beautiful baby girl in my arms. And so it gave me even more reason to live. Mm -hmm. So those lessons that cancer taught me, which I'm, I'm obviously trying to teach others, um, and hope that they learn without going through the difficulty. <laughs> Sometimes yeah. difficulty is the only, you know, is the best teacher and you just can't learn any other way. <laughs> but if you're smart and you're wise, then you try to learn from other people's difficulties, right? From other people's, uh, challenges and triumphs and victories and failures. Right. And so that helped me a lot uh, because I just realized the money or success or prestige or reputation, like none of that matters. I just want to get well and I want to take care of my family. And so now it's 20 years later, I still all I care about. I just want to take care of my family. I don't want to stay healthy. So I, I just have, I have really strict limits on my time. I just, I'm not a workaholic. I don't, I don't even work eight hours a day. Mm -hmm. I just don't, I, you know, I keeping my stress low is a priority. And, and I've been able to, you know, on a practical, like maybe business level, I've been able to automate, right. And, and bring on a team of people to help me do what I do. So it doesn't take every waking hour of my life yeah. to, for, for me to do interviews and then make cl clips and post them to social media and, and kind of do all that kind of stuff we do to, to reach people. And so having a team and having help and having systems and some automation, which is so easy now with technology, like, yeah, yeah has definitely freed me to do the things that I get the most joy doing, which by the way, is like interviews. Like I get the most joy and fulfillment from sharing my story and sharing what I've learned and talking about forgiveness I get, you know, that to me is so much more fulfilling than, you know, a lot of the other stuff involved with any kind of business <laughs> endeavor. So, and I love to read and research too, you know, so, um, that, that time, those are things I like to focus on. I won't name the things I don't like to do, but yeah, <laughs> you, you, I have them and you have them. Yeah. yeah. And so, so we have a team so for, for you, right. It's like, it, it, I know it's, it's a process of like, okay, how can I, you know, limit my work time and really have quality time with people I care about. I'll, I mean, just is a lot of it because that's yeah. life. You know, that really is life and relationships are life. Like being with your friends and family. I mean, that's such a big thing. And so I could talk more, but I think that, you know, I think I've said enough about that. You know, it's just, yeah. you just have no. to decide what your boundaries are. Like, so like a practical thing for me years ago was, I was like, well, I'm not going to work after dinner. Yeah. It's not going to do it. I'm not going to work. I'm not going to open my laptop. I'm not going to go in the office. Like as soon as 
it's dinner time is family time. Yeah. Right. And everything dinner till bedtime that's for the family. And, uh, and so that's, again, it's a simple kind of thing, but it's so easy to just, you know, work through dinner or, or eat dinner and then go back to the office and do more work. I mean, the work never stops. <laughs> you know? Yeah. You could literally like, work 20 hours a day if, <laughs> if you wanted easy. to. Yeah. If you, if you're running any kind of business, like, you know, and you're doing interviews and ma making content and producing stuff. Yeah. You can just work every hour of the day forever. And it, so you just have to decide for yourself how much is enough and be okay with it. And, and by the way, like I'm not very prolific. You know, like I don't put out, you know, we, we release a one interview a week, less than that on average to my audience. And, um, you know, I've written three books and kind of have a new book project going, but I just, um, it's not worth sacrificing my health. I've learned that lesson. So there's no amount of money or fame or I don't even know success that's worth losing my health over. Yeah. So I hope your, your listeners take that to heart because Hey, like Steve, and Jobs, I do too. Think about I, it. Steve Jobs, yeah. most successful guy, you know, I'm mean, incredible, successful. I mean, incredible man and, and success. And he lost his health, right? He lost yeah. his health and there was nothing he could do to get it back. Even with all that money, couldn't Even pay for enough money. treatment or whatever to get it back. Yeah. Even with the money. And so, you know, your, your health, health, this is a cliche, but health is wealth. Yeah. Yeah. No, I, I appreciate the wisdom. Um, that was definitely more of like a selfish question for me as I'm like looking to kind of scale and impact more people. Um, uh, no, I really appreciate it. And you know, a few things, and I want to be respectful of your time. I, I do want to say a massive thank you for coming on the show and kind of sharing your story, sharing your wisdom. And I do love the work that you do. So I'm going to, I'm going to buy five of your books. Um, I'll do a giveaway on Instagram. So if you guys are listening to this episode, head over to Instagram. Um, there's going to be all the instructions. Basically, I won't say which book I'm going to buy. You can pick whichever one out of the three books that Chris has. Um, and then we'll just ship that to your house, right? It's going to be open worldwide as well so that's awesome uh, well if you buy five i'll throw in another five awesome well, i appreciate that but i we'll appreciate give away that. 10 how's that sound perfect all right well i'll, I'll make that post you guys 10 books that are up for grabs so be sure to go and check that out chris thank you for jumping on man i'll put all your links down below see crispy cancer your books your youtube channel all the amazing work that you do because i want more people to have access to it because it was a huge help for for me and, and my late partner um and i people need more people need to know about it Thank you so much, man. I appreciate you. I, I just love what you're doing. And um, it's a privilege and an honor to, to speak to your audience and um, to hang out with you and share my story. Thank you. Yeah, thank you.